Hi, I'm Michelle Ward. As a mom, I've looked my children in the eyes with love and hoped I can lead them toward a bright, wonderful future. But as a neurocriminologist who's been studying violent crime for the last 20 years, I've also quietly hoped that at the very least, I'm not raising a future serial killer. And if you can relate to that taboo thought, congratulations, you've just found your new favorite podcast. This is How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. Hi, Melita. Welcome back to How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for agreeing to do this again. Of course. And Melita's kid is not a potential serial killer, just so we're clear. But um, Melita's a good friend and likes to come down and help me. So thank you. Of course. So today we're talking about Todd Colehep. What was your reaction when I told you to look him up? Well, okay, so let me start by saying that I am deeply disturbed by all this kind of stuff. I'm not one of those people that love this genre. No? No. Mm -hmm. So I'm probably not your core audience, but I did look up Todd and I watched some stuff and I was deeply and profoundly disturbed. Welcome to my world. Yeah. How do you sleep at night, Michelle? Um, bottle of wine. I don't know. No, I compartmentalize this. Well, I like watched the movie Seven in high school, mm. and sometimes I put my head down at night and I still am jolted you see awake. The head in the box. Yeah. No, it, not that image. Um, one, some of the other ones. That one didn't bother me that much. Um, but like the, the head in the box didn't bother you that much. As much as some of the other sins, oh. but. Yeah, but that was, you know, decades ago. So they don't leave. You're not that they old. Don't, they don't leave my head is yeah. what I'm trying yeah, to and say. Yeah, it is. It can be a problem. That can definitely be a problem. If it's not something you can... Actually, I enjoyed doing this a lot more when I didn't have children because it, it just didn't affect me the way it does now. Yeah. Even though I've always loved children. But okay, so let's so Todd. let's tell, talk about Todd. The name Todd, it sounds pretty innocuous, right? It's yeah. It's not like... Conjuring up images of violence and rage. It's not as bad as Ted. Right, right, right. Right. Totally. But it turns out the man behind this actual name is anything but innocuous. The word menace or creep might better describe this serial murderer. But hey, what's in a name, right? On March 7th, 1971, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida... Todd Christopher Samsel was born to Regina Tagg and William Samsel. So Todd's biological parents actually divorced when he was really young. He was like two. And he remained with his mom, Regina. And shortly after the split, Regina Tagg moved to South Carolina and married Carl Kolhep, which is why Todd has this last name. He already had two children of his own. I don't know if he adopted Todd, but Todd took his name. Unfortunately, changing his name did little to unite Todd with his stepfather. In an interview with journalist Maria Oz, Todd explained that from his perspective, his relationship with his stepfather was quite normal until Carl, that's his stepdad, his two biological children were kidnapped by their bio mom. That's what Todd says. What? But somehow those kids got to stay with the kidnapping bio mom? It's curious. Anyway. Florida. 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 According to Todd, that event marked a sinister shift in Carl's personality. He quotes, Carl's attitude was hostile, and that's on a good day. At this point, the Kolhepp's family dynamic began to change dramatically. Carl had lost his two children and Todd, his siblings. So from here on, Todd wanted nothing to do with his stepdad, Carl. And in fact, he started to harbor resentment, he says, toward him. And in the same interview, Todd explained that Carl and Regina seemed to push Todd away after the loss of his two siblings. He recalled spending most of his days locked in his room. Yeah, you're making the face I made. While Todd points to this specific event as the beginning of his downward spiral, others recall a very different story. According to most of the adults in his life, Anger and vindictiveness were Todd from a very young age, and those were his defining traits. His mother claimed that when Todd was around 15 months old, she became concerned because he had uncontrollable rage and anger. I mean, 15 months old can be full of rage, but this was different. Young Todd, who was known as the neighborhood bully in preschool, 
he would destroy his little classmates' art projects. So rude. And a few years later, he was kicked out of Boy Scouts. I didn't even know you could get kicked out not of Boy Scouts. Not nice, no, no, Not no. nice. He's super disruptive. No one wanted to be around him. And it seemed like everybody kind of just passed the buck. But his behavior around other kids, his age, was always violent. That is how it is reported that he related to his peers. It was just with violence. And animals were not immune to his rage either. Get this. As a child... Todd killed his pet goldfish by pouring bleach into the tank. And then he also shot his neighbor's dog with a BB gun. Oh, my God. I'm glad he doesn't live near me. Well, here's the thing. He reported that the bleach was to clean the tank. But someone else reported that he wanted another animal. And his mom's like, no, you can only have one. And he's like, all right. Now I don't have any. You know what? My friend Annie, she cleaned her tank with Dawn soap because she was a kid. And she thought, how do you clean things with soap? Did she kill it? She killed her turtle. Is she a serial killer now? No, she's not. She's an animal lover. Um, Actually, for realsies. So his mom said that she had to put locks, multiple locks on her door of her own bedroom at night because she was like, he's going to come in and hurt me, kill me. So she'd lock herself in the room. Red flag. Red flags. In a CBS News article, Todd's mother said, this is a quote, if he didn't like something I did, he'd find a way to get back at me. One time, I did something he didn't like and he stuffed all the bath towels down the commode and stopped it up, flooded the house. At her wit's end, Regina found a therapist for Todd. And shortly after that, he was admitted to a psychiatric hospital. That's a big deal. If you are showing signs or saying things to your therapist that get you admitted to a psychiatric hospital, that's that's a lot. That's a big deal. Young Todd's deepest desire was to move out of his mother's house. And this is once he's back from his stint at the psych ward. And he wanted to live with his biological father, who he didn't really know. Time and time again, Regina rejected Todd's request because Todd's father was a bit rough around the edges and not exactly parenting material. Now, remember, he didn't have a relationship with Todd at all. um, And he let another man pretty much adopt him. So, But, you know, that's one of the situations when you're a kid and you're behaving badly. It's never your fault. It's, oh, it's my mom's fault. It's it's my mom's fault. It's my stepdad's fault. It's, you know, I, it's going to be magical if I move in with my dad. But it's not because the problem is Todd. When Todd was 12 years old, his mother bought him a brand new bedroom set. And on CBS News, Regina said, The next day, I came home from work and he had taken a claw hammer to all of his new furniture. She explained that Todd was angry that she wouldn't let him move to Arizona with his biological father. It was this incident that convinced Regina that letting Todd move in with his father might be the best thing for him and her. She sends Todd to Arizona to live with his dad for the summer. And Todd enjoyed his time with his father so much that he threatened to kill himself and his mother if he wasn't allowed to live there permanently. So Regina was like, okay, she had no choice really at this point. And she's, you know, let him go and hope for the best. Spoiler alert. It wasn't the best. Mm. Now living in Arizona, Todd found out that he had a lot in common with his father, William. For example, both loved guns and explosives. Do we see where this is going? The pair bonded over this shared fascination with collecting weapons. William even taught his son how to make bombs. I feel like if you know your son just got out of a psych hospital, mm. you maybe, maybe you find a different hobby. How about soccer? Right, right, right. Whittling. Whittling wood? Yeah. Yeah. No, here, hot son, there's a gun. Med- meditating. Meditating and yoga. Yoga. Yeah, yeah, no. But in the haze of this picture-perfect father-son relationship, a familiar pattern emerged. Todd became resentful of William. Here's our pattern. He was spending too much time with random women on dates and not enough time with him. Yeah. When Todd demanded that his mother and stepfather take him back, his mother made excuses to extend his stay with William. She's like, mm you're not coming home. Regina indicated in an interview that she wanted to keep her marriage with Carl intact, and she worried that Todd would tear them apart. So at that point, it did seem to Todd, and maybe to everyone, that nobody really wanted him. But he wasn't that easy to have, you know. It's really easy to look back and be like, this went wrong, that went wrong. But 
he was problematic before this stuff happened. November 25th, 1986 was a fateful day for Todd Kohlhepp and an unsuspecting 14-year-old girl. That night, Todd decided to visit a friend at her house in Tempe. It was right down the street from him. When he arrived, he told the girl that her ex-boyfriend wanted to see her, and this was a boy she still had a crush on, and that he was waiting for her down the street. She didn't seem to buy it, and she refused to leave her house. So Todd skulked around for hours trying to convince this friend to follow him into a dark alley. After several attempts to coerce her out of her home, his demeanor took a dark turn. Todd asked if they could chat in her backyard, and for some reason she complied. She probably thought, okay, what's the harm? I'm in my backyard. She was babysitting her little brother and sister at the time. She opened the back door only to be met with a 22 caliber handgun pointed at her head. Like, this is a kid she knows from the neighborhood. And he's like, come over, come over, come over. Todd then led her down to his father's house. And at one point, this girl grabs the barrel of the gun. She's brave. And he shoots it. He fires the gun, but it misfired. She would have been dead. Todd proceeded to restrain her, duct taped her mouth, and raped her. The girl recalls being absolutely terrified. She had never undressed in front of anybody before her. Todd held a knife to her throat while he sodomized her. And she bravely told him, You are so dumb, you don't even know where to put it. Wow. Meanwhile, this this young woman, this young girl, 14-year-old, her little brother, who she'd left home alone, called the cops. So Todd sees the lights, and he realizes what has happened, that the police have been notified. And she makes this promise that she would not tell the police what had just happened to her. And he, she gets him to believe she's super coercive, but he did not take it, believe it right away. But she's like, look, I'm not going to tell anybody. No one's going to believe me. It's not, I'm not going to do anything. And he says, if you tell them, I will kill you and your little brother and sister who were six and three at the time. So then this gentleman walks her home. She goes into the back of her house. The cops are all in the front. The girl tells Todd that she's going to tell the police that they were out looking for a dog, a lost dog. But her father looked at her and was like, what's wrong? What happened? He saw right through the lie. Good, good dad. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the officers were informed of what had happened mm. and what took place at Todd's home. And then, of course, they walked over there and they knocked on the door. And an officer recalls Todd said, well, how much time am I going to get for this? No remorse, no guilt, no concern, just how is this going to affect me? When the juvenile probation officer recommended he be tried as an adult, Todd accepted a plea deal that would dismiss the sexual assault charge, but still require him to register as a sex offender. Oh, hmm. Hmm. Huh. Raping a 14-year-old girl? Yeah, this is my how things have, have progressed and changed. They have not. Mm-mm. Okay. Todd was given 15 years without the possibility of parole on January 19, 1987, with stern commentary from the presiding judge. Soon stern. Af- stern. Oh, Please stern. stop raping children. Mm. Soon after his arrest, Todd was diagnosed Bad with boy. borderline personality disorder. See, this borderline personality disorder, they slap it on anytime someone tries to kill themselves. It sounds kind of blanket, huh? Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm noticing a lot of it. But he also has an above average IQ of 118. His psychiatric evaluation also showed sides of shocking emotional disturbance, but not psychosis. So that means he's obviously like emotionally disturbed, as we can see with rage and anger. And but he's not psychotic. He's not hearing voices. People aren't in his head aren't telling him to do this. He's not seeing things that aren't there. So that's an important distinction because he knows right from wrong. Okay. When asked in this evaluation why he raped an innocent girl, he said he was angry at his dad. Hmm. I've been angry at my parents before. Hmm. Hmm. I feel like I just, you know, went into my room. An evaluation of Todd's record after the rape indicated that Todd's mom had reported that he was always filled with emotional and behavioral problems. And she says it started when he was 15 months old, like I said. So even as a toddler, Todd was aggressive and vindictive toward his peers. Not normal toddler aggression, because we all know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. This was the only interaction he had with people. 
Our friend Todd was released in August 2001 at the age of 30, and he moved to Spartanburg, South Carolina. Having been too young to drive before landing his prison sentence, Todd got his first driver's license and landed a job at a sports apparel store, but not without fabricating an employment history on his resume. It might surprise you that while Todd was incarcerated, he obtained a bachelor's degree in computer science. And after his release, he completed a second bachelor's degree in business administration. In 2006, Todd became a real estate agent and owned numerous properties. He even got his pilot's license. What? (laughs) Listen, serial killers need hobbies too. Here's the thing with guys like Todd. They get what they want. They're goal-driven. He set his mind to it. Okay. I mean, he's probably not telling Listen. people on the first date that I was in a psych ward and prison, but I swear to God, I got a lot of properties and I've got a great future. It probably seems on the outside to everyone around him that he was going in the right direction. But in his twisted mind, he was still very obsessed with sex and violence. And many of his female co-workers claimed he'd make inappropriate comments to them. And he watched graphic porn at work. I feel like I'm not judging porn watching. I'm the work but you can't you can't do that at work no you can't in the fall of 2003 Todd decided he wanted to get a motorcycle because you know planes trains automobiles so he visited Superbike motorsports unable to get the hang of riding it he returns the bike to the store and he asks for a refund allegedly when todd explained his conundrum of not being very balanced on his bike to the Superbike employees, he was laughed out of the shop for trying to return his bike. He left the shop, he stewed, he returned armed and angry. And in a fit of rage, Todd murdered 30-year-old owner Scott Ponder, his 52-year-old mom Beverly, 29-year-old manager Brian Lucas, and 26-year-old mechanic Chris Sherbert. Police arrived to find four bodies strewn around the property. 13 years went by until investigators connected Todd to the Superbike murders. So those families went 13 years without understanding who slaughtered their family. Can you imagine? There was no DNA. There was no... Nothing connected him at that point. If you've listened to my podcast for more than 10 minutes, you know how I feel about the importance of balanced nutrition and key nutrients in your diet. Take your omega-3s, people. It is no secret that addressing nutrient gaps in your diet is essential for your mental health, and that is why I'm so excited to talk to you about this episode's sponsor, Care Of. Care Of is a subscription service that ships high-quality, personalized vitamins, supplements, and powders conveniently to your doorstep every month. Care of's ingredients are thoughtfully sourced and backed by research, so you can feel good about what you're putting in your body. And for my vegan and vegetarian listeners, Care of offers omega 3s that are sourced from algae oil. That is so cool. So you can continue your plant based lifestyle and take care of your brain and feel good about that too. You start by taking a short, in depth quiz about your lifestyle and health goals for a personalized, doctor backed recommendation. Again, we all know how much I love research, and this is the place to get your supplements that have been researched. And this takes the guesswork out of the supplements that are best suited for you. Each shipment also comes with a customized pamphlet, which shows you exactly what's in your individual daily packs and why it was recommended specifically for you and your health goals. So it asked me all sorts of questions about what I'm looking for, hair, skin, brain health. And when it spit out my results, it was so interesting because some of it's the stuff that I already knew I should be doing and haven't done, and they can put it all together. These are individual packets. And like, for some reason, after I had kids, my hair started getting all wonky. And also just as we age, our memory has problems. And there are, I mean, and these are supplements I actually know work and they're all together just for me. So I know exactly what to take every day and I'm not guessing. For 50% off of your first care of order, go to take care of Dot com and enter code how not 50 again for 50 percent off of your first care of order go to take care of.com and enter code how not 50 
12 years after the Superbike murders, Todd struck again. The next known killing probably occurred in December 2015. Todd tells a different tale of this double murder than, well, everyone else, but that's pretty standard for Todd. His stories are always different. Todd claims that Megan Coxley was frequently down on her luck and often panhandled. According to Todd, he wanted to help her. He's a real altruistic person. He wanted to help her, so he hired her and her husband, Johnny, to do some odd jobs for his real estate company. And he also had a tremendous amount of property, acres and acres and acres. So he constantly did need people to work for him. So that part's not unlikely, but that wasn't his motive. His motive was clear, as he told investigator Maria Oz, he honestly thought he would probably get some sex out of it for helping her. He literally said that, straight-faced. Then one day, according to Todd, Johnny pulled a knife and attempted to rob him. That doesn't make any sense, but Todd doesn't care. Todd accordingly acted in self-defense and shot Johnny. He then restrained Megan. I've seen this thing I'm about to describe. He kept her in a large storage container, like a container like yep. that goes on a ship. A shipping container. That's right. Yep. I saw that on the yeah. on my cursory research. At one point, Todd says he decided to let her go in Tennessee with four thousand dollars, but she couldn't say a word about the murder or kidnapping. Todd recalls that she was initially excited for her offer, restarting her life with this huge sum of money, he says. But then, according to Todd, she started acting like a caged animal. He mused that she might have some sort of serious chemical imbalance. So Mm. she's she's the the one with the problem, Todd. Right. The one you've locked up. Like a POW. Right. Right. Then he explains that Megan lit a building on fire and it was her or me, so he shot her. Todd said to investigators that this killing really bothered me because it was such needless bullshit. I took the lesser of two evils, in my opinion. Now, everyone else, investigators, friends, and the family of Megan Coxie paint a very different picture. Shocker. They recall that Todd was a regular at his local Waffle House and was obsessed with Megan, a waitress at that restaurant. And Megan was so uncomfortable with Todd's presence that she frequently asked a male cook to take his order, because she could tell. Then, in a moment of financial weakness, Megan and her husband, Johnny, were hired by Todd to do some work on his property. Only a few months later, they were reported missing. Almost one year later, authorities would find the remains on the same property. Then, I mean, Todd has an M.O. He strikes again in an eerily similar missing persons case. November 3rd, 2016, Kayla Brown and her boyfriend, Charles Carver, had been missing for weeks with no leads until they found a post on Kayla's Facebook page that she and her boyfriend had begun to work for Todd on his property on the day of their disappearance. So naturally, police began investigating Todd's property after a ping from the two missing persons' cell phones placed them in the area. During their search police recalled hearing a banging inside a metal shipping container on the property. Inside, they discover 30-year-old Kayla Brown chained to the wall like an animal. She had a chain around her neck. Kayla told the police that Todd had shot her boyfriend in front of her as soon as they arrived at the property, and that Todd had kept her in the shipping container and raped her for months. Kayla had then mentioned that her boyfriend was buried somewhere on the property and that Todd admitted to burying additional victims around the same location. Todd was arrested soon after this discovery and given seven consecutive life sentences for his crimes. And in August 2020, his possessions were auctioned off and all of the proceeds were granted to his victims after their families filed a wrongful death lawsuit. Good. Oddly, this murderer would gain his nickname, the Amazon Review Killer, from an unnerving revelation after his arrest. Now, this is going to be interesting for Melita because Melita works in this industry. But first, I'm going to tell you, Todd had an Amazon account where he went by the name Me. He's yeah. very original. <laughs> me. It's me. Yes, Todd, you're the problem. <laughs> it's you. Okay. He wrote disturbing reviews on various weapons and supplies that he purchased on the website. Some of these purchases included a chainsaw, a knife, Uh, and a portable shovel. mm. Perhaps the most vile review was a padlock. Solid locks, he writes, have five on a shipping container. 
won't stop them, but sure will slow them down till they're too old to care. On December 2017, Todd wrote to the Spartanburg Herald Journal that there were still more victims that had yet to be discovered. As many as 100, he says, but he didn't give any information about the others. Todd is currently serving out the sentences at Broad River Correctional Facility in Columbia, South Carolina. Melita, can we talk about those reviews? Tell, tell the listeners what you do. Yeah. So, I mean, I work in marketing. I work in brand marketing. So that means I work on a product that you can buy at a store. Like, you know, I've worked on shampoo and body lotion and a lot of products, uh, food products. And, and then um, I work, you know, like as a director of communication. So that means that I work on the ad campaigns, social media, and I oversee like PR and basically the community manager. So anybody that you, you know, that tweets from a brand or writes the Instagram posts in the voice of the brand. And so I kind of find it interesting that nobody on the Amazon side or on the padlock side that they're not moderating, right? Because that's their job. He wasn't even vague. Like these reviews are like, oh, no. I mean, they were creepy. They were creepy. And and sometimes people are funny. And I think that funny reviews kind of get attention, especially they get reposted now on Reddit, for instance. And, and then they garner even more attention. So is that why they let them lie? They, they leave them there? Like the reviewers who review the reviews? Well, okay, so if you do a negative review, you know, because there's so many trolls, so the rule is you you leave it, right? Mm-hmm. Because you don't you don't respond to trolls because then that just kind of mushrooms out of control. Right. 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 But if you violate a community policy on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, then you have to let the platform know, mm. right? So I, I worked on a product, a chocolate product, like one of the top candy I, bars. I know, I know which one it is. Okay. And somebody was very unhappy, okay, with the candy bar. And this, this is so ridiculous. I can't believe that, that you know, it's one a really would, bad candy bar. Yeah. One would do this in their free time, but they put it out in a field and took a bunch of guns and, and shot at the candy bar that person's a serial killer and that's on the list (laughs) you shoot you shoot chocolate you'll shoot anything you know so somebody like me who oversees a team did he post it oh yeah Mm. so it was posted on our facebook page and so so then so somebody like me finds that and is like oh well this isn't really my problem this is kind of Facebook's problem right because they have their own set of rules and regulations and so like I escalated to them they they take it down okay right so somebody should have seen this and done something I think so for sure but I think you know with the gun related violence that we see right I mean and I think that and then we see on online platforms that there are signs right mm-hmm. on social media and i know this is amazon and this is a a retail platform but yeah there's kind of this like hindsight hindsight bias right mm-hmm. when you hear hoof beats you're thinking horse not zebra like you're not yeah. thinking oh i bet this is a serial killer posting this right yeah that's true it's a it's a hindsight bias so that's the thing about this guy he's textbook on his highway to hell like He's not one of these where oh, I couldn't see it coming. Nobody suspected. Everyone who knew Todd suspected. Right. Since 15 months or 18 months or whatever. He called his mom. He had no relationship with his mom. Essentially, once he was in prison, he called her and he's like, mom, I killed people. And she's like, oh, Todd, how many? And he's like, what? He's like, a lot. You don't have enough fingers to count how many. And I'm like, oh. she didn't even sound surprised. Oh my God. There are so many places where Todd Colehep fell through the cracks. And that's not to say that his environmental situations caused this because it didn't. It didn't. But everyone, I mean, he was a callous and unemotional kid. And 
everyone kicked the can down the street with this kid. It's like his mom and dad mm -hmm. can't deal with him. He goes to his, he goes, you know, to a psych ward. They let him go. Mm -hmm. She still can't deal with him. She sends, he gets to go to his dad's. His dad can't deal with him. Nobody wants him. In every way that could make this troubled child worse, they did. Now the mom did like seek help. I mean, what, what is she supposed to do? The, she sought a therapist. The therapist tried to get the guy help. He went away. And then he comes back and he immediately goes to her dad, his dad. So I don't blame the mom. It's just when you have a child who's like this, I would hope that today they would be con he would be considered conduct disordered, obviously, but also high on callous and unemotional traits. And that's yeah. important. Yeah. That's a trait we see in fledgling psychopaths. So I need to be clear about that. While almost all psychopaths were callous and unemotional um, as children most callous and unemotional kids do not necessarily become a psychopath okay so the hallmark of psychopathy is you know lack of remorse lack of guilt blunted affect low emotions all of that and they look like that as kids they don't care like they laugh when their family members get hurt they don't like someone can die they couldn't care less they hurt their own pets they're just, they don't have the normal emotions and they also don't read cues well. Not, not, not saying they're on the spectrum, autism spectrum, it's not that, but they don't, their emotions are all pretty blunted. Now, emotions like rage and anger, like to Todd had, that can be there. That's the conduct disorder part of it. So he would be today probably conduct disordered, CDCU, like conduct disordered, callous and unemotional. So it's understood in the research and clinical communities that people with psychopathic traits are very sensitive to rewards and immune to punishments. So putting them in juvenile hall, taking away their phone, you know, taking away their bikes, taking, it doesn't work on these kids. It just does not work on psych kids who end up being psychopaths, on kids who are high on callous and unemotional traits as they are measured that doesn't work. And it's so frustrating because they are the kids you want to punish the most because they're so bad, but it just doesn't work. Punishments don't work. Specifically, they're more motivated by rewards than the average person. Okay. So we all want what we want, what we want but most of us can delay the gratification or can understand that we might not get everything we want. For a psychopath, they can't do that. They can't wait. They might be able to wait, but they're, they're not accepting that they can't have what they want. So they want what they want right now, and they just don't have much regard for the consequences that can come with getting what they want. So, you know, he did whatever he had to do to get the pet he wanted. You know, he killed his goldfish, right? according to some, to get a gerbil. He did whatever it took to get sex. And he literally says he went over there to get that girl, not because he was mad at his dad. He now says he wanted sex. He did whatever he needed to do to sell real estate. He lied about his jobs, lied about who he was lied about his past and didn't tell anyone he was a sex offender. But suffice it to say, there are a ton of studies showing that these kids who look a lot like little psychopaths do much better in programs or treatment or parenting where it is structured and it's reward-based. But in general, I think they're discovering that softer discipline and more structured reward systems are what's working best for everybody. Okay. But for these kids, it's the only thing and it works better on them than it does other kids. Okay. And there's a reason. You ready for this? I'm it ready. It turns out, shocking, it turns out that there are a couple of brain areas that are related to reward seeking and impulsive behavior. And they are structurally different in the psychopath than they are in other people. Today, I'm going to focus on the striatum. Now, this is cool. The striatum is, it's a, it's a critical component for the motor and reward systems. And it's, it's part of the basal ganglia. It's a very interesting structure. It doesn't really matter what it does, but it's well replicated that it is related to the whole, not only just seeking the reward, but the impulsivity that we see surrounding it. It's also related to repeated actions associated with seeking the reward. So it's not just reward seeking, but it's like doing this th the thing, gambling, that kind of a thing, like the thing you need to do to get the reward. Um. Plus, here's a kicker. It's related to enhanced learning from reward stimuli. So the study I was going to tell you about, which was from one of my mentors when he came to USC, he, you know, when you're a young professor, research professor, you don't have, I mean, it wasn't even a... He, he, he was new. It's like it's right after his postdoc. You don't have a lot of money. You do everything on a shoestring budget. So he just borrowed a bunch of 
juvenile offenders from Eagle Rock and they did like a card game that had a reward system to it. Not only did the ones with the psychopathic traits do better, like more, they were more upset if they lost, they were happier if they won, but they learned the game better. They learned it quicker. And it's, that's the striatum is related to enhanced learning from reward stimuli. So in psychopaths, it's many studies. This is not just a one-off. I never say anything that if it's something, if, if, if I'm saying something that's going on, I'll say it was one study, but this is something we have found more than once. There's a as much as a 10% increase in the size of the striatum in psychopath. Now, we don't say a psychopath. It's a population, you mm -hmm. know, in a group of people high in psychopathic traits compared to average controls. Like, it can be up to 10% larger. Okay. This increased activity in the striatum has also been seen in violent alcoholics and aggressive teens and kids. But do you want to hear something even creepier? Yeah. Aggressive conduct disordered children like Todd Kolhep have increased activity in the striatum when they view people in pain. They enjoy seeing people in pain, just like a serial killer does. This isn't like a nature versus nurture either, right? He didn't... No, this kid was born with these tendencies. Yes. His environment might not have helped him, but... Right. He was born with these tendencies. I don't know. I mean, shoot, you can argue there was birth trauma, whatever it was. Right. But you, when you see these traits... You can't ignore them, and right. especially when they're pervasive over time. And studies have shown that, you know, we're going to send put a link up. There is um, there's all sorts of programs that you can take a kid like this to, even when they're really young, mm -hmm. all sorts of them. But who knows which work? So there's a, a study, an NIH published study looking at meta analysis of all of these different programs for these young kids. And um, and it actually ranked them based on their success rate. I mean, of course, it doesn't follow them longitudinally. We don't know if they become criminals later, but we do right. know a couple years later, this one's still working, that one's not working. Compare, they'll compare them to controls, they'll compare them to other programs. It's So we're, we'll put that up. And one thing that was really interesting about these studies is some of these programs do actually work. They do actually work, but you have to seek it out. Mm -hmm. You have to go to Google, you have to type in, conduct disorder child, troubled child, treatment. And there's inpatient, there's outpatient, there's clinical settings, there's school settings, there's parent focused, there's child focused, there's all sorts of different studies. What they have found is that under 11, children who are under 11, the parent programs are most effective. Mm -hmm. So that's they're training the parents. If you find, you, if you have a regular conduct disorder child who does not have these callous and unemotional components, Maybe any of those programs that are rate, that ranked by the NIH would work. But if you have a conduct, conduct disordered child with these callous and unemotional traits, you want to go to the reward-based okay. programs. So, okay. So what when you say conduct disordered, can you give me some examples? You know what? I think it's best if we just define it. I mean, yeah, we all know... You what a conduct disorder kid looks like, right? It's like, it's the kid who's misbehaving, the kid that's disruptive, the kid that's hurting other kids. I was kids. super disruptive, but. <laughs> the, the, the child who is um, hurting other kids or just won't behave, won't sit down, um, impulsive. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna give you the actual, like, I'll Wikipedia this um, because I act, I mean, I've been studying conduct disorder for so long, really just as it relates to psychopathy. But I forget that, like, let's just take the bigger, yeah. the, the more general view. It's conduct disorder refers to a group of behavioral and emotional problems characterized by disregard for others. Children with conduct disorder have a difficult time following rules and behaving in a socially acceptable way. Okay. Their behavior can be hostile and sometimes physically violent. So if you have one of those, first of all, it's not necessarily your fault, parents. So let's start there. I know there's so much shame and there's so much reluctance to say, I'm worried something's wrong with my kid. It's there's so much stigma, but usually it's not your fault. Usually, I mean, we all come out with predispositions mm -hmm. and obviously trauma in certain parts of our childhood could definitely make you take a left turn. But sometimes you're just born with a predisposition for whatever reason. And there are programs out there that can help. Some of them train the parents. Then the parents take those 
those skills and they do it in the home. For the older kids, kids who are older than 11, they tended to do better with programs dealing directly with them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is um, they do cognitive behavioral therapy, but the, the ones that work the best for these types of kids with this callous unemotional part is soft discipline, but very specific reward structures that are very consistent. And they teach the children that it benefits them to behave and they get rewarded for good behavior. And really the earlier you catch this, the earlier you start treating it, the better the outcome. So if you have a 15 month old who you're worried about, get some eyes on him, right? But that was just the first opportunity to help Todd. Once he was in a psych hospital, you, you, you don't just stop it. And Todd said, I remember listening to an interview, Todd's like, all they did was drug us up. We didn't even know where we were. So there wasn't a ton of therapy probably going on there if you're all drugged up. And then I guess and then the other thing I think about is conduct disordered or not, when we think about implementing as parents a reward system, I think a lot of parents use screen time as a reward mm -hmm. now. What else do they use? <laughs> Give me some ideas right, because right. I want to know. Um, and that's probably not right either. I mean... It's probably not the best reward. I mean, you kind of, it's tough because it's, what and you're not like supposed to, to use food either because then you're going to give them disordered right. eating. So yeah. So what are well, some, like what are some <clears throat> reward ideas? So when I talk about these reward systems, there are parents, there are some children for whom you can just teach the parents. It's hard for parents to do it. Some of the conduct, conduct disordered children with callous and emotional traits who end up in inpatient facilities. Mm -hmm. I know how those work too. Mm -hmm. The ones that are most successful use a very specific program tailored to what that kid likes. Yeah. Pokemon cards, money, oh. freedom. Like you get to go to the movies, you get to go see a friend, you get whatever motivates. Right. It, it, the reward has to be very specific to, to them, the, to the person. Yeah. My child doesn't care about money. Mm hmm. He likes candy. Great. He doesn't realize that he could buy candy with money, right? <laughs> like, I mean, he does, <laughs> you know. He can't drive himself to the store. Right. But um, I mean, and I'm not proud of that the statement I just made. But yeah, it's it's hard. The things that he is motivated by are not the rewards that I want to give but you can definitely see a motivation when well, I like think a it's difference a in motivation. I mean, absolutely. And I think it, one of the keys is consistency mm -hmm. and flexibility. So when you have a four year old or a five year old, they're mm -hmm. rewarded by certain things, but the whole structure of these systems is, and it's and usually it's like multidimensional. They work with the kids and they work with the adults. And, you know, sometimes that's implemented even at school, but the whole structure is it's consistent. So you only get these things if it's this reward and those things, whatever they are, sometimes it's points. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they gain points by good behavior and then they can use points with whatever they want. Right, right, right. And so you, whatever it is, the inconsistency is a problem. It has to be super consistent. And that's why sometimes it's hard for parents to do it. It's much easier for it to be done in a school setting, a clinical setting, but it oh, does, totally. it works better at home. Like it, if you can do it right, like this one, one center, it's married couples who are trained in this and the the boys go and live with them at their home and the entire home is set up like this like this is just how it works very little punishment it's all reward and these kids thrive but the other part of it that is is important and especially when you see it in a young child is they're not great first of all they don't really care they don't they're callous and unemotional by definition they're callous they don't really care if they've you can't talk them into be like, oh my gosh, this has really hurt so-and-so, but you have to try and you have to make them, you might not be able to give, to create empathy in them, but one of the things that they don't do well is understand human faces. Like right. what is your emotion saying? Yeah. So you get down an eye to eye contact. I like I constant eye contact is supposedly really helpful in getting them to understand a little bit more of the 
this has hurt this other person. Like this is not good. Don't punish them necessarily, but trying just to consistently make them understand. They might not understand the feeling of worrying about hurting a sibling, but they'll, with consistency, they realize that it's not about punishing them when they do it. It's about rewarding them when they don't. So it becomes a, a, a program where they become interested in behaving well because it works out for them. They're never going to be super emotional, empathetic people. That's right. not just, that's just not what it's going to be. But at least they're not totally unaware of how their behavior affects others, mm -hmm. you know? And then just teaching them about, you do this with children on the autism spectrum. You, you teach them like, what are ways that you can see how so-and-so is feeling other than words? And you'll have some of these children say, oh, body, like, is he turning away from you? Is he crying? You know, is he, does he look scared? But I mean, remember these adult psychopathic killers, you show them a picture of somebody screaming in terror. Remember that one I've talked about, he's like, oh, that's, I don't know what that feeling is, but it looks like what people, the face people make when I stab them, right before I stab them. Uh -huh. So anyway, that's another element of it is teaching the child, you know, really getting down on their level and trying to, um, teach them about reading social cues and, and, and emotional cues from other people rather, not social cues, oh. emotional cues. You know, so when he's looking at that 14 year old and seeing fear on her face, I doubt it even registered for him. I doubt it, I doubt it was even. I wonder if when she shamed him, that worked. That was a pretty mm. good burn. It was a pretty good burn. For a 14 year old girl, I mean. Yeah. Also, he almost just shot you in the face. So I feel like yeah, and was... she had the wherewithal to mm -hmm. like, yeah. And her little brother knew to call the cops at six. Yeah, I know that story is particularly strong family. And and that's the thing. Like it seems like everywhere. Okay, so great. Todd Colehep gets out of prison, and he he's not out on parole. I guess he did his whole sentence. Do we just let that? I mean, if you've done your time, do you get to just? go anywhere and be i guess you do you've done your time but when it's someone like todd colehep i feel like that can't be okay i actually hmm. think it's really bad how post like convicts people who have spent time in prison are treated when they get out like i understand not telling people that you've spent time as especially if you're a violent offender you don't advertise your stint in prison mm -hmm. but it is so hard to get a job you are so labeled i get it Thank God for these organizations. There's a lot of organizations that only hire yeah, yeah. people who've been convicted of violent crimes. Good for them. Even once you do your time, you should be able to lead a relatively normal life with the exception that if your entire life has been peppered with violence against hum other humans, I don't think you can go without some oversight. Also, how do you work at a sports authority or I don't know which store it was because you didn't say equivalent get enough money to buy property. I think what he did the is real he estate. sold real estate yeah. and was super successful. He had one of the most successful, it was like a company, a big company. He had people working for him, realtors working for him. But no, again, like even, even realtors have a code of ethics, like no, no background checks there either. And he, he didn't lied. even use a, he didn't even use a pen name. No, his company was called Todd Colehip and Associates, like so TKA. He used his real name, yeah. the one he was convicted. This guy's nothing if he's not bold. Yeah. But P.S., it worked. If he hadn't started yeah. killing people. And then he goes as me, too, on me. Me. On Amazon. I wonder how they even figured that out. Like, I mean, that is very bold, like hiding in plain sight again. Yeah. yeah. You put the letters in the mailbox. Right. But it, I think it's really important for parents there's no harm if your kids a little different a little aggressive doesn't really care about hurting other people there's no harm in implementing these strategies getting help now it's not like they're going to immediately medicate your child they're not going to take your child away that's a huge fear people have that they're going to someone's going to take my child away they're not going to take your child away but if you can it's like physical therapy or occupational therapy for child's not walking you start that any developmental delays, when you start it earlier, it, the earlier you started, the better outcome. It's the same with this. The earlier you start implementing treatment, the better off the outcome, the better off the child is. 
and I think that's the big message here is I'm not saying he was going to, you know, become Mr. Rogers. I'm, as I said, he's just not, you, this is the only shot you have. Right. Well, Melita, thank you so much for oh. doing this again. You're a good friend and you're a good mom. Oh, thanks, Michelle. So are you. You're also really smart and that's really helpful. So I can bounce things off of you and get good ideas. So this has been another episode of How Not to Raise a Little Serial Killer. Thank you and we'll see you again soon. How Not to Raise a Serial Killer is a Cloud 10 Media production, executive produced by me, Dr. Michelle Ward, and Sim Sarna. Our editor is Emily Crane. Our music was created by Josh Cook, with artwork provided by Brian Stefanik. Follow us on Instagram at How Not to Raise a Serial Killer and on TikTok and Twitter at Hentrask. That's at H N T R A S K. If you like our show, do me a favor and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. After all, if more people know about the show, maybe fewer kids will turn into serial killers. Who knows? Thanks so much for listening. See you next week.